awesome, awesome song. Started a series on uh, questions with you, and uh, we're going to continue that, but we're jumping a little bit ahead in the scripture from where we were because today is the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, and we want to honor the uh, unborn and uh, those that uh, God has placed in the wombs of, of our land and in the world. And uh, what, a, what a miracle it is, human life and the conception of human life. It's such a great miracle. And uh, the abortion crowd has just thumbed their nose up in God for a, at God for a long time now and destroyed life after life through abortion on demand. And uh, we have taken a stand against that years ago. My father was one of the first in this community to stand against abortion way back when 1973 when Roe versus Wade was being debated. And uh, my father was one of the first ones that, that actually stood in, in a li very liberal town, this town of Gainesville, Florida, that uh, he took that strong stand. And we've, we've followed in his footsteps all these years. And after a while, the other Christians in our area caught up, and uh, they have fought it too for years on end. We've marched in the uh, rallies for life. We marched against abortion in, in Tallahassee. Many have gone. Some of my friends are in the... Uh, the National uh, Right to Life March in Washington yesterday, the day before, and our president actually, the first president we've had that has actually gone and spoken at the Right, the right to Life March, and, and I tip my hat to our president for doing that because of being on the, the side of the unborn, and I think that's wonderful. But today, I hope none of you lost sleep because our government shut down. I didn't lose any sleep last night. And uh, everything went, went on as normal in Gulf Hammock, Florida, and, and how about Gainesville? Did it go on as normal? Y'all okay in Gainesville and Lachlan County, and uh, but uh, listen, it might be a, not be a bad idea that some of the stuff that they do there is shut down for a while. You know what I'm saying? That maybe maybe they won't get into so much mischief. You know, but we we do uh, pray that that will be resolved soon because we want our our uh, soldiers to get their paychecks and the seniors to get their paychecks, that sort of thing. But uh, a lot of the other stuff we could dispense with, and uh, I'm not too worried about it. I think they'll come to a conclusion pretty quick. So just pray for our, our government leaders and pray that they won't play politics like they're doing and they'll get something done to, to continue uh, representing us there in Washington, D.C. But as we think about uh, the right to life and the sanctity of human life, I want you to go over to the uh, book of Genesis with me for a moment. And we're going to go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, where in reality this is part of the, the questions that we would be uh, following if we were following chronologically anyway. But uh, we, would have, we would have gotten here in a week or two. But uh, here in Genesis 4, 8, it's a story when, when uh, Cain and Abel, you remember that story, it says in, in verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Think about that for a minute. The blood of this first person murdered upon the earth was crying out to God from the ground. And God heard that cry. Let's begin with prayer as we think about the blood that has been shed on our soil since 1973 when millions of babies' blood have been shed in America and how they've cried out to God for, for revenge and for justice. Lord, I thank you so much for the Word. And Lord, even way back then, the very first murder, Lord, you intervened and stepped in and questioned Cain, Lord, for, as to his motives. And Lord, I pray today that you will intervene in, in our land and that you will step in and you will confront and condemn those that are doing this horrible thing called abortion on demand and help us change it in our lifetime. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Where, where is Abel, Cain? And what did Cain respond with? Question of his own, didn't he? What was his question? Am I my brother's keeper? Well, why should I care and why should you care about abortion today in reality? Why should we care? It doesn't affect you unless you have someone in your family having one or if it's your daughter, it really affects you or if it's your granddaughter, it really affects you. But why should you care as a believer 
or as a human being for that matter, why should you care about abortion? Well, I believe there's some real good reasons that we should care about abortion because I am my brother's keeper. The answer to that question when he says, am I my brother's keeper, what is the, the, the legitimate and right que answer to that question? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Does that mean I take care of every, every single need he has? No. <laughs> because if you read further in the scripture, it says we should each bear our own load. But it does mean that we should care about our fellow human beings, doesn't it? We should care about our fellow man. And I thank God that I, I am in a country called the United States of America, and we, do, we really do care about our fellow man. How many of you would raise your hand and say, as Americans, we do a lot for the world? Have, do we help feed the world? Yes. Do we feed people here that need it? Yes. We do a lot for, for people that are downtrodden. In fact, we do more than we should at times. And we have created a whole generation that believes that it's, you know, they don't even have to do anything to get those sort of things. So I don't condone that, but I do condone helping our fellow man. And I think you and I both would agree on that, that that's a good thing. That we are, in that sense, our brother's keeper, aren't we? And, and I love to help those that can't help themselves, and particularly the helpless. You know, we should especially care about the helpless. The little babies that can't speak for themselves. Those that are disabled and uh, don't have the mental capacity to deal with life themselves. I, I think we should, we should care about those people and help them. The elderly that have, that have paid their dues to our society and, and uh, they've paid their taxes all their life and now they're in a situation where they can't do it on their own and they don't have family members that can help them. I, I am all for caring and helping people like that. How many of you would agree with me? Would you say yes? We would, you know, I and I think we should especially care about the helpless. But how do we arrive at this point in American history where it's okay to just murder little babies in the womb? It's okay to snuff out their life because it might be an inconvenience. See, it'd be one thing if it were if it were endangering your life and, and if you were going to have that baby, it was going to kill you. I mean, if we legitimately knew that, it might be one thing. But that's pretty rare. That's pretty rare with modern science today. There's so many things that we can do to save the life of the baby and the mother. And, and babies are born these days. What's the youngest baby you know of, Dr. Prine, that has been born and, and lived? How many weeks? 20 weeks. And they, you know, listen, there's modern science today and modern medicine. Thank God for that. So the using that to protect the life of the, the child or the mother is kind of a misnomer sometimes, maybe maybe misused. But I really do believe that we've arrived in, a, in this point in American history in which uh, it's considered okay by some to take the life of the unborn. But I, for one, believe that it's a horrible thing. I, for one, believe it is, it's, it is actually murder in, in the same fashion that Cain murdered Abel. Now, if you're here today and you have had one, don't please don't con think what I'm saying to you that I'm condemning you. I'm not. If you are under the blood of Christ, if you're a believer, and Jesus has forgiven your sin, he's forgiven that sin too. And I don't hold you accountable, and God doesn't hold you accountable for that, because he, if he's forgiven you, he's forgiven you. And the Bible says he's, he's taken your sins as far as the east is from the west, and he won't remember that anymore. And, and so don't take anything I'm saying as a condemnation of, of you personally if you've had one of those things. But the concept as a, as a whole, and as it's played out in America today, I really believe is an evil thing. And I, if you go back to how, it, how do we get this point in American history, it started back in 1973 when the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand. See, the problem we have is we've had a liberal Supreme Court most of our lifetime until recent years, until we finally got a little bit of a balance on it. It has always leaned to the left. And it's, not, it's been a left-leaning Supreme Court for most of my life until recent years. The decision back then was 7-2, to two, and Justice Byron White, in a dissenting opinion, reminded us at that time, there's nothing in the Constitution or in constitutional law to support such a decision. And there wasn't, because in reality, the, re, the Roe versus Wade decision, which was not based upon truth, it was really based upon six lies, and I'll give those to you in a few minutes, but 
in, at that time, and, and as it happens a lot of times in our lifetime, it's raw judicial activism. Judges legislating thing, things from the bench that are not in our law. And it's only on their personal opinion. Their, their personal opinion. See, the Supreme Court created a law out of thin air, not based upon precedent in the law, but out of thin air. There is no right to privacy found in our U.S. Constitution. No right to privacy. And abortion is not found in our Constitution. And yet they wrote this law guaranteeing the right of people to have abortions if they wanted to. See, abortion was a solution to the results of the sexual revolution that occurred during my high school days and early college days. The sexual revolution in which the morals which v that governed the Western world for 2,000 years finally were rejected by America. There was an epidemic of sexual immorality and people, that was when the, the song, Love the One You're With, remember that? It don't matter who you love, but love the one you're with, you know. It don't matter what you do, just sock it to you, sock it to you, sock it to you. That was the mantra of the time. And listen, it cost America greatly. And the, moral, the, the morals of our nation went way down. And that's when, when uh, the AIDS epidemic hit later, a couple years after that. And unwanted pregnancies were everywhere. And the solution to the sexual revolution was kill the unborn babies. Kill the unborn babies. In reality... If you go back to what Margaret Sanger said long ago with, from Planned Parenthood, the founder of Planned Parenthood, the, the real reason was to control the black race. And since that time, you might not know the statistic, this is, this is up to date, the 12th of, of January, 18 million, 21,412 and a half, I don't know how they got a half kid here, but 18 million black babies have been aborted since that time. And if you go back and read what she said about controlling the black race, you know, it's, it was a racist movement to begin with. The abortion on demand was. Now, the solution they came up with killed the unborn babies. And, and since that time, in January the 22nd, 1973, see in World War II, Hitler murdered some six million Jews. And we call that the Holocaust. You, how many of you have heard that word before? Do you know there are people today that deny the Holocaust? Yeah, they say that didn't happen. Oh, yes, it did happen. It did happen. But what has happened in America since 1973 is worse than the Holocaust. Some 44 plus million babies have been aborted in America alone. 44 million plus. That's New York City has a population, if I remember right, about 25 million. That's like two populations of New York City being wiped out. Think about it. Two complete giant American cities, all the people in that city being snuffed out. And that's equivalent to what ha has happened because of abortion. See, this is America's Holocaust. And it was based upon six lies under the Roe versus Wade decision. Lie number one, Norma McCorvey, her name, we, they called her Jane Roe in the law. She was promised an abortion by her attorneys. She didn't have one. <laughs> they lied to her. Uh, they needed a plaintiff to sign an affidavit challenging the laws against abortion, so they used uh, Norma McCorvey. Lie number two, will the decision be made in time? Jane asked her attorneys if the decision would come in time for her to get a legal abortion. They knew it wouldn't, but they did not tell her the truth. Her child was four months old when the abortion was made legal on January the 22nd, 1973. Lie number three that it was based upon. Jane Roe was gang raped. No, Norma McCorvey was not gang raped. In fact, Norma was not raped at all. Norma's attorneys lied to the Supreme Court saying that she was. Lie number four, the Doe versus Bolton case. The same day the court ruled on a companion case, Doe versus Bolton, this decision allowed abortions to be performed outside of hospitals. This legalized the clinics, the abortion mills. Sandra Cano, who was Mary Doe, did not even want an abortion. She wanted custody of her two children. And they used that to push this through. Attorneys insisted her mental and physical health would be jeopardized if she didn't have an abortion. Lie number five. 10,000 women die from back alley abortions. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the founder of the National Abortion Rights League of that time, 
He said, I knew that the figures were totally false, but we used them anyway. Later, he became a pro-life advocate, and he, and he confessed that those numbers were fabricated. And he said this. He said, in the morality of our revolution, it was a useful figure. You see, it was a revolution to overturn the morals of our time. Lie number six, the media passes on the lies. The media are as guilty as anyone else in the abortion industry. They refuse to show pictures or details of the, of the results of an abortion, and they carefully censor pro-life information. Still happening to this day, because we have a leftist media. And one, one uh, leader of our land calls it fake news, and it, it truly is fake news, because they don't give you the truth on a lot of things. But there's good news. Norma McCorvey, she died, uh, in, I think, last year, but she became a, a born-again Christian and a pro-life advocate until her death. Uh, Mary Rose Sandra Cano is now pro-life, and Dr. Bernard Nathanson, founder of the National, Abort Rights, National Abortion Rights League, is also pro-life. I think he might have passed on since this was written. So why... Why should Bible-believing Christians, why should we oppose abortion? Why should we oppose abortion? Well, I believe, and I believe the Bible teaches that all human life is sacred. All human life is sacred. The, the, the Black Lives Matter and those sort of movements should have said all lives matter instead of just Black Lives Matter because human life is sacred. Genesis chapter 127 says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. We are created in the image of a, a holy and righteous God. Human beings are different. We're not animals. We are humans created in the image of a holy and righteous God, and, and all human life is sacred. Now, I believe in protecting the animals too, but in a different sense. I don't protect the animals because they're created in the image of God. I protect them because we, not, we ought to be kind to animals. Amen? But see, we ought to be even kinder to human beings. And see, the human life has become uh, disposable in many, in many people's eyes today. And, and, but it is not in my eyes, and I don't think it's in God's eyes, because all human life is sacred second reason that you ought to be pro-life and, and a Bible-believing Christian ought to be pro-life and, and stand against abortion is that God demands that human life to be protect, is to be protected. God demands this. Genesis chapter four, uh, 9 verse 4. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast I will require it. At the hand of man, at the hand of every brother's man's brother I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. You see, God says, he demands that we protect human life. It was, a, it was written long ago when the scripture was being written down and, the, and human law was being implemented. That was one of the first laws put into effect. Protect human life. The third, third reason to take human life other than in war, self-defense, or capital punishment is to commit murder. See, some of you have been soldiers and, and maybe you wonder, well, I went to war and, and I took lives and is God going to hold me account? No. No, it's different. It's not, that isn't murder in the sense that the Bible speaks of murder. In fact, here's what the Scripture said in Numbers 32. Moses said unto them, If you will do this thing, and it was talking about going to war against this uh, evil a nation that had attacked God's people. So if you will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward you shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sins will find you out. Listen. When your nation requires you to go to war and you don't go to war, when they ask you to and you don't go to war, you've committed the sin. Not if you go to war and take life. He said, your sin will find you out. So, and he said, you will be guiltless when you go and, and, and take care of your nation when, when it is required of you to do so. In the same way of protecting one's family. The Bible says if you don't protect your own, you're worse than, a, than an unbeliever. 
You know, so don't bother God's, you know, don't bother my grandchildren or my children because I'm not going to be kind to you. <laughs> if you. If you try to hurt them, you will pay the ultimate price. Get, be it known. <laughs> and, and if you're, a, if you're a, if a, a good human being, you'll protect your, the children that, that you have brought into the world and your grandchildren and your families and you'll protect the helpless. And if you have to go to war, you'll do so. And the Bible also talks about capital punishment. And we, we read that a moment ago in, in Genesis 9. If, if someone takes a person's life, you know, in murder, you're supposed to take their life. And that's why we have governments in place that do that. Now, there's a whole movement calling themselves Christians out there that fight capital punishment tooth and nail. And I, I can't understand that because it, it, it's clearly written in God's Word. Listen, capital punishment is, is legitimate. And sometimes their their uh, uh, argument is, well, there's so many min minorities that are that are in on death row, and and there's so many people that have been tried and, and found guilty, and they're not really guilty. Well, we have a lot of modern science these days, and we have uh, DNA testing and that sort of thing, and and that's why we have appeal the appeal process. And they're given plenty of time to find out if the person is guilty or not. But when it comes down to the final statement from God. God says if they take a human life, humans are supposed to take their life. And so capital punishment is legitimate. Uh, but it's not murder. Now, number D or number four, if you're writing numbers down, murder violates God's law. God's specific law. Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments, verse 13, Thou shalt not kill Thou shalt not murder, if you want to get a, a ac accurate translation there. Thou shalt not murder. Fifth thing, God holds us accountable for this type of national sin. See, it's not only a personal sin, but it's a national sin. It, it, it counts against the nation. You know, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, is what, uh, what the Proverbs states. Proverbs 24 says, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. We do. We have an appeal process, don't we? But how about the little babies that are sentenced to die because, through abortion on demand? It says, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Save them as they stagger to their death. Don't excuse yourself by saying, look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts and He sees you. He who, guard, he who guards your soul knows you knew. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. Listen, people are going to stand accountable to God one day for having supported the abortion industry. People are going to stand before God and be held accountable before God because they were they just said, eh, let them do it. We don't care. We, we're, we are for it. Listen, you're going to stand before God and be accountable one day because 44 million plus in our country alone and their lives have been snuffed out. The next one, we must stand for the unborn if we want to stand on God's side. God stands on the side of the unborn. Don't hear it, it's kind of quiet. God stands on the side of, how many of you think God stands on the side of the unborn? How many of you think he stands on the side of the abortion doctors and the abortion mills? No, I'm sorry. If you raise your hand, you're, you're on the wrong side of the issue. Psalms 68.5 A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God takes special interest in, in kids that don't have daddies and mommies. He takes special interest in the fatherless. He, he takes special interest and loves them specifically. And widows, those of you that have lost your, your, your wives, some of you husbands have lost your wives, some of you wives have lost your husbands, widows and widowers, God takes special interest in you. And he, and he says this in Psalms 82.3, Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Who's he talking to? <laughs> Who's he talking to? Defend the fatherless, the poor and the fatherless, and justice to the afflicted and needy. Put your finger on your chest. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. It's a command of God that we should stand against those that are trying to hurt the fatherless and the poor and, and the needy and the afflicted. Another one, another scripture that talks about the afflicted, it says comfort the afflicted. Some people are afflicted. You know, put your hand up here one time, okay? When I say afflicted, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, afflict, they're afflicted, you know. And uh, we, sometimes we say that in just, boy, he's afflicted. But listen, the Bible says comfort them. 
you know, they, they don't have enough brains to get out of the rain hardly. So we have to, we have to protect them and, and comfort them. But the little babies in the womb don't either. Amen? And, and we, we need to even be more protective of them. In fact, there's their law in the Old Testament. If you injure a woman that's pregnant and her baby dies, you, you're, you're held accountable. Because that baby is considered not only her life, but the baby's life is considered sacred before God. Now, brothers and sisters, abortion needs to stop now. Listen, I've stood against it. My father stood against it before us. I've stood against it my whole life. We've, we've stood on the side of the highway every year on October the 5th. For many, many years, we've stood there holding up signs against abortion. We, I've picketed next to bread and roses right here in Gainesville with signs stopping abortion. I've never picked up arms. I've never picked up a rifle. I've never done anything in, in the way of violence toward that movement. But I have physically stood against it. And I want you to physically stand against abortion. I want to convince you to be pro-life and that you help us stop this evil thing in our lifetime. Listen, we, we, if we're ever going to do it, it has to be done now. We've had conservative president, well, we call them conservative president. We had numerous terms of people that we were Republican, quote, conservatives in power. We had the House, we had the Senate numerous times. We were in power. They went there with promises to overturn Roe v. Wade and stop abortion on demand. Now, have they done it? I think it's time. If we're going to stop abortion in our lifetime, it has, to, it has to happen now. And I want to give you three ways that we can do it. Number one, only vote for pro-life candidates. Only vote. If they are not pro-life, they won't openly say, I am pro-life. Absolutely, 100%, do not vote for them. Do not vote for anybody of any party that says they're pro-abortion. Listen, they've been in power long enough and, and enough babies have been murdered with them in power. It's time, that they, it's time that it changes. We need to change that. Only vote for pro-life candidates. Number two, or B, vocally oppose abortion. You need to be vocal. You need to write letters to the editor. You need to, to be willing to stand with signs like we have. You need to be willing to say so if you're pro-life. Vocally oppose abortion. Let your congressmen and senators know what you believe on that. And then the third thing. Let's see this horrible, murderous practice overturned in our lifetime. I want to see it overturned. Okay, I'm, I'm sick of it. I really am. I'm tired of little babies being murdered. And, and I, I can't stand it. Since, since you've been here, you know how many babies are aborted per day? <laughs> this is in this uh, handout out there if you'd like it. 1,277 babies are aborted per day. 1,277 babies are killed here a day. That's 53 children every hour whose lives are murdered in America. What? 53 children per hour. So the time I've been speaking, 53 since the music started till we say the final prayer, 53 babies were murdered. And, eight, and as I said before, 18 million black children have been murdered by abortion since Roe versus Wade was passed. So brothers and sisters, it's time for it to stop. But it's not going to stop unless you uh, rise up on your hind feet and, and get involved and say so. And become pro-life. Vocally. Stop being quiet time you come out of the closet. They want people to come out of the closet. You need to come out of the closet. Okay? And you need to let people know what you stand for and especially on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. You, people are hearing similar sermons all around America today because it's Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And Bible-believing churches are saying what I'm saying. Now, your liberal churches are not. There's some liberal churches out there that, that lack abortion and they support it. Financially support it and, pu and push candidates that are abortion, uh, you know, providers and abortion uh, advocates. Listen, needs to stop. Needs to stop. Amen. Let's pray, Heavenly Father, Lord. I pray that you will help us stop this evil thing called abortion on demand in our lifetime, Lord, because all human life is sacred and created by you. So help us, Lord, to be uh, one of the one of the instruments you use to help stop abortion in our lifetime. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.